Great to be with you, Hope Reformed Baptist Church. Uh, can you please open up to Romans chapter 5, and we will be looking at verse 9 and 10. If I haven't had the, uh, the absolute pleasure yet or privilege of meeting you, and that even goes for some who may well have been here for a couple months sometimes, it's the case that it takes a while to get around and meet everybody. If you're new or if you're visiting, I'd love to chat to you afterwards. I'm sure one of the uh, elders would, uh, uh, more than just the, the, the person who's invited you along. Uh, but for the regulars as well, all of you who are here, the faithful, the congregants, the, those who sit under and receive the Word of God faithfully, Romans chapter 5, verse 9 and 10 gives us our theme today, our theme tonight in asking the question, what does the blood do for us? What does the blood blood of Jesus, the blood of Christ, the blood of the Lord, what has it accomplished for us? What does it mean for us uh, in the idea of the new covenant that we explored last week? We've looked at many different avenues or many different facets of the glories of Jesus' blood like a diamond. There are so many different ways to hold up this doctrine of blood and see new sparkling beauties shining out of it as we do. We've looked at all sorts of ones. This, this study is going to be coming to a close over the next few weeks and we'll move into a series on uh, the book of Judges, studying uh, uh, so, some of the, uh, the, the anti-heroes, if I can call them that, from the Old Testament and that'll be our evening sermon series. But for now, we find our ourselves in Romans chapter 5 and verse 9 and 10. Would you look there with me? In fact, we will be reading from verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one would hardly ever die for a righteous person, although perhaps for a useful person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been, here's our theme, since therefore we have now been justified. Since therefore we have now been by His blood, how much more will we be saved by Him from the wrath of God? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, every word there needs to be emphasized. For if while we were enemies of God, there's so much here. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more. Now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his Life. May God bless this word in our midst this evening. Amen. Our theme of discussion tonight and study is around the idea of justification in Christ's blood or in Christ's death for us and in his love for us. So as a Christian, we have this uh, language. And if you were here during the Galatian sermons, you've he heard it. If you've pre heard me preach more than, say, five times, okay, you've probably heard about the doctrine of justification because the doctrine of justification is the gospel. It is the good news from God to mankind, to lost sinners. And justification, the big idea is this, that we transfer legal status, legal standing, or legal uh, 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 situation and uh, 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 standing before God because God does something to our legal account. He doesn't change your person. He doesn't change your behavior. He doesn't change who and what you are or what you've done or what you're going to do. That's not what justification is. God does change you in your behavior, but that's not justification. First, while you are still a sinner, like the Bible just here tells us, while you are still weak, while you're still a sinner, while you're still ungodly, while you're still an enemy, all of those words are there describing us. While you are still guilty, condemned, and sinful, God does something in the legal courts, in the books of heaven. He, he moves things around. The language is imputation. He transfers some credits to different accounts and thereby at the end of it, he can legally, according to all of the books, checks, laws and balances, look at you and say, I approve of you. I am infinitely approving of you. You may come into my presence, much less, much more in fact, you deserve to come into my presence. In fact, I would be unjust as a just God if I did not welcome you into my presence and shower blessings eternal upon you. That's what justification means. Now, that all sounds quite 
we can use the old word scandalous. It almost sounds blasphemous. In fact, it does sound blasphemous if you're, if you're familiar with the true doctrine of God in Scripture, the one true God who exists, that he is pure, righteous, and holy, that he is a just anger against sins and crimes, and he says such things as in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 34 to Moses on the mountain, I will by no means clear the guilty. God will, in the end of time, God will, across all of history, at the close of history, on the last day, there will not be a single sin that has gone unpunished, and there will not be a single guilty person who waltzes their way into heaven. God says, I'll never clear the guilty. Guilty people will have their sins paid for, full stop. God of the eternal covenant promises us that. So how is it, if if that's the true God, how is it that we can then say that in justification, God looks at us who are sinners and approves of us and is pleased in us and over us and accepts us? How can that be the case? How can a morally upright, perfect, a perfectly holy, just God who knows everything, not just the stuff on your books, but on the stuff in your mind and the stuff you didn't even know you did, how can that kind of God look upon a Christian with blessedness, with approval, instead of anger and punishment and judgment, when we, when you, when I, have committed so many sins and crimes? And the answer is justification. God can declare us righteous. God can look at us and be approving over us and legally grant us blessings, justly, fairly, legally, Because he has undergone a process, because he has accomplished a work, an act called justification. Justification means uh, to uphold the standards of the law or to establish and and fulfill the standards of the law. So in other words, we, we come and you can read this in Romans 1 through 4. We understand this, that the law stands over us as a perfect representation of God. It's not as if God's over there, the law's over here, and sometimes they speak to each other. Uh, It is that the law is simply the expression into words and commandments, a codex, if you would, a codified uh, standard of God's own perfect righteousness. Uh, uh, The the law is God's perfection itself imprinted into human laws that we can understand. And so the law of God demands that as a human who wishes to be in the infinite judge's presence one day instead of under his judgment in hell, if you want to avoid hell, avoid judgment, avoid punishment, then all you need, the law demands, is a perfect record of righteousness. That is, absolute perfection according to the law. So if you live 10 years and We're taken into heaven then. You need 10 years of absolute perfection in word, motive, thought, and deed. If you live 85 years, then you need to provide God, provide the law. You need to submit to the law a actual, factual, true record of 85 years of righteousness. Never sinning once, never breaking the law of God, never committing a crime against the holy standards of heaven. However... If you have committed any sins, you have ever broken any of God's law, then here is what else the law demands of you. The law demands a death for your sin. The Old Testament prophet Ezekiel says, the soul that sins shall die. Simply the requirements of the law. So the law demands uh, to be absolutely perfect, to have a positive righteousness, and failing that, or at least for every sin... If you have a perfectly righteous life and one sin, then for that sin, your soul must die and undergo an eternal torment, uh, uh, pay off an infinite amount of suffering. That That is what the law demands. So the law demands that you be perfect and for any sin that you die. Therefore, if you have sinned, you need to conceive of the impossibility that that even if you sinned once, you still have to go to hell forever And then after you've been in hell forever, an impossibility, then you can go into heaven and receive the rewards for your absolute perfect life. That's what the law holds out to us. An impossible standard, but a true, right, godly, and righteous, just standard of God's law. To ask the question, why would God make that so demanding? Why would God set the bar so high? 
is actually an incomplete, incoherent question. Because the law is merely a communication of what God's like, we can't really say, why did God set the bar so high without asking the question or without admitting that, that at the base our question is simply, why is God God? Why couldn't God be a different God with lower standards? That's what we mean when we say, couldn't God have lowered the bar? And since the very ground of all existence and logic is God himself, to ask, what if we had a different God, is simply to ask, what if we existed in a different universe altogether under a different creator, and imagine it all you will, that's fine, but you're trapped in this one, so you've got to deal with the reality of this one. And this is where God exists, the law is the reflection of his standard, and we stand infinitely incapable of meeting it and of satisfying the law. That is why Romans 3 tells us that by the works of the law, uh, sorry, Romans 2 verse uh, uh, 21, uh, sorry, 3 verse 20, I got it right. Uh, by the works of the law, by o trying to obey the law, in other words, no human being will be justified in God's sight. There's no such thing ever in all of history under any covenant where anybody does enough good deeds, this counts as even people in tribes of heathen lands and in uh, rainforests and in deserts and in far countries and nations that never heard about the Bible or the gospel, no human has ever been justified or declared righteous and approved in God's sight by the law because it is impossible that a human being lives up to the law. It's impossible. And yet, the demands of the law are not lessened just because nobody meets it. The law has no capacity of mercy because it's simply the reality of God's holiness put on paper. So unless God could change his internal reality and being, which he can't, he is immutable and unchanging, complete and entire in his eternal and infinite perfections, only if he could change himself to be less than he is, could the law ever lessen its standards? Therefore, the law has, by, by necessity, the law has, by definition, the law has no capacity for mercy. The law has no capacity for grace. The law simply is God's infinite, internal, eternal standards of righteousness. So our options are this. As a human, provide a perfect human righteousness of your whole life completing and perfectly ticking off every law, and for every sin, die in eternity in hell. In comes Jesus Christ. Or in the language of Romans 5, at just the right time. Christ died for the ungodly. While we were weak, unable to do anything ourselves, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. There's the whole solution and balm and, and salvation of every human ultimate problem and dilemma according to the law of God right there in one word. Christ. At the right time, Christ. The grace of God in Christ. The salvation of God in Christ. He died for the ungodly. So this is what Jesus did in his provision by way of justification. Satisfying the law. Here's what Jesus did. Jesus lived a perfect life under the law because the law demanded a record of human righteousness. Now, sinners can have his righteousness credited to your account. Secondly, Jesus died for sin under the law, sin not his own. Jesus died for sin not his own under the law, because the law demanded death for sin. Therefore, sinners can have their death debt removed from their account. You can show God your death certificate because Jesus died instead of you. Therefore, Romans 3 tells us that a righteousness, a salvation, a justification has come through the law, but not by the law. Fulfilling the law, but not asking you to obey the law. The law and the prophets told us about it, but the law and the prophets didn't provide a way of accomplishing this righteousness. This righteousness is, in fact, Jesus' lived record righteousness, gifted, uh, engrafted, uh, in, uh, implanted, we could almost say, into your legal account, or the technical language, credited 
or imputed. And that's all accounting language. If, if you're a total nerd and you chose for your whole life to enter a career of counting numbers and paper, I feel sorry for you and your spouse and the friends you talked to around the cooler. If you people talk in, num in words and not numbers and code, I don't know what you are, but if you're an accountant out there, you get this. Crediting, accounting, imputation, credits. The, the transfer of credit to another account. This is what God has done in justification. The, the question becomes, who benefits? It is not the case that because Jesus died, therefore all human sinners can be justified and under God's approval. That is very clear and obvious in the Bible. Not everybody falls under God's pleasure. So the question becomes, for whom did the death of Jesus Christ pay for the death penalty under the law? And for whom did Jesus' life fulfill a righteousness for the law. Who was counted dead in Christ's death and who was counted righteous in Christ's righteousness? Who has Jesus on the cross representing them and in heaven perfect representing them? Who? For whom did Christ die? Who did Jesus live for and who gets the benefits of his death? And the unbelievable language of Romans 5 is it is these people, the weak, the ungodly, the sinners, and the enemies of God. That's who benefits. And if you deny that you're any one of those things, then it wasn't for you, and you don't benefit. If you admit that you were one of those people, but refuse to take the benefit from Jesus, it was not for you, and there's no benefit for you in Jesus. If you admit that you're these things, a sinner, weak, ungodly, unrighteous, and you come to Jesus and ask for his benefits, then his benefits on the cross and in his life avail for you, and you have what Paul calls justification. So the ungodly in Romans 5 is the language of that one who is opposed to God's standards, just antithetical and opposite to God in personality and character. That's you and I by nature, we're ungodly. God is godly. We're just on the opposite end of the spectrum, plummeting at light speed away from God's standard. That's ungodly. He calls us the weak because we're unable to save ourselves because we're unable to produce a righteousness by the law. He calls us the sinners because we are criminals against God's revealed law's standard. And he calls us enemies because we hate God by nature. These are the people who benefit by Jesus' life and Jesus' death, and therefore receive justification. The one requirement is to rest in God's promise and trust in Jesus as the solve all for your legal calamity before the, uh, before the righteous, holy judge. That's the one requirement. That's what we call believing on Jesus, or leaning on Jesus, or calling out to Jesus, or trusting in Jesus, or the, Paul, the, the word that Paul loves to use is faith. The language of faith is, a, is the language of trusting, believing, uh, leaning on, receiving into your own self the promises of Jesus and all of his benefits. Uh, Calvin used to say, the gospel is Jesus Christ clothed with his benefits. And he comes and takes residence within you. That is faith. This is therefore what we call justification by faith alone. This is a, this is a marker of the true gospel. There are lots of supposed ways to heaven. You've got to believe in Jesus. You've got to have faith. You've got to believe the Bible. And you've got to obey a couple of the laws and do a few penance and, and speak to the guy in the box. And he'll give you a couple of extra prayers to do. Or in other instances, you've got to go to these certain places in the world and make certain sacrifices or at certain other uh, uh, groups in this car park lot. Uh, you have to give certain bits of money and purchase saving holy oil from the promised land, have it doused upon yourself, then your soul has some cleansing. There's all sorts of different ways that people tack on some doing onto believing. But Paul defends bulldoggedly, that believing is the only way to be saved. Because doing is what damned you, so quit your doing and just believe. He says in Romans 3 verse 28, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. That is, faith alone. Faith without works. Faith without doing. 
Romans 4 verse 5 says, Now to the one who works, his wages are counted not as a gift, but due. God owes you salvation if you worked for it. And to the one, verse 5 says, to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Not your works add up to righteousness. Your faith counts as righteousness because faith receives Jesus' righteousness. Meaning, the second you have faith, you have an infinite human righteousness. The moment you have faith in Jesus and what he promises to be able to do for you, there is nothing to earn, do, accomplish. Get this through your minds. It is impossible to gain more favor with God if you have faith in Jesus. There's no conceivable such thing in all of logic. There's not even in God's mind any such thing as any further favor than you currently already sit in, doused in, baptized in, flooded by the favor of God that you already have if you just have faith in Jesus. It's impossible. So, so there's no more favor to obtain. Not there is, but you can't get it, so be settled on the level of favor you have. There's no such thing as more than infinite favor. And there's no such thing as Jesus' infinite righteousness earning us anything other than infinite favor from God. So the moment you have faith, therefore, with no works, with no obedience to the law, if all you have is faith, you have an infinite righteousness. God smiles upon you legally through the code of the law and says you have satisfied the law because you have received Jesus and he did it all for you, ungodly, sinner, weak, criminal justified, child, friend, godly one. This is justification by faith alone. And in summarizing the first four chapters, which teach us all about this, Paul says in verse one of chapter five, therefore, since we have been justified by faith. There's just a world of meaning in there, isn't there? It's all past tense. Since we have been already accomplished, since we have been justified by faith, here's one of the benefits, we have peace with God. The judge doesn't sit angry at us anymore because as far as being a judge goes, he doesn't see any of my crimes. They are all paid for and buried in the grave that Jesus was buried in. There's no such thing as anger from God arising towards me or anybody who has faith as far as his condemning rage or his legal requirements go because the law can make no demands on me anymore. I love the law. It's been written in my heart. It is still the standard of the God that I love, so I love to walk after it and walk in it. The law is a light and it is life. But it can't make any demands of me because I don't need to give God anything according to the law to stay justified. To be justified by faith in Jesus means I am infinitely and certainly and securely righteous in God's eyes. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is justification. Now, by the time we get down to chapter 5, verse 9, he, rather than saying we have this justification through the Lord Jesus Christ, he summarizes it even further on theme with our sermon series and says we are justified by his blood. We have now been justified. We are now justified because we have been in the past justified by his blood blood. So why is it? Let's get back into the gear of asking the question that we've asked every single line in this series. How is it that the blood of Christ does X for us? Tonight, how is it that the blood of Christ justifies us? Why, why does God, through the writing of the Apostle Paul, want blood on our mind as we think about justification? Why does he want us to have a bloody religion? Why does he want us to consistently offending our sensitive and vegan world by using language of blood. Do you know how many more, more vegans we could have in the ministry if we just got rid of all the blood, meat, sacrifice language of the Bible? We don't want them. We don't want them. But imagine 
how much more acceptable. Like, there's all sorts. In every generation, there's something that if you just waited it out, you'd get a lot more people in the pews paying tithes, right? Blood. God wants blood as on our memory, on our lips, in our songs, in our thoughts, in our Bible study. If you color in girls in your Bible with your highlighters, draw lots of blood. It's biblical. If you get bumper stickers, get splatterings of blood. Uh, with, make sure people know it's a bumper sticker, uh, of course. That would be the, the qualification. Why is it that God wants blood in our language and we couldn't have just said cross or uh, life of Jesus? Because as the Bible has shown us through and through and over and over again, the blood of a living being, the blood represents, and this is the paradox we keep on looking at. I wonder if you get it right. The blood within a living being represents its life. And the blood outside of a living being represents its so, so, so that the blood is able to both represent the life value of something and also the fact that that life has been paid or given or sacrificed in death. That's the value of blood. That's God's marvelous design for the use of blood. We can argue from Leviticus, this is why God made mankind and animals after us on the same day or in, in the same creation week to have the same stuff, blood. He did it on purpose for the sake of teaching lessons through atonement, ultimately pointing to the cross. I don't know if we'll have blood in glory, but the lesson, the message, the image, the meaning of blood will continue on forever. Blood. His blood represents Jesus' life. His blood represents Jesus' death. His blood is perfect blood. It is righteous blood. Therefore, it is law-satisfying blood. It is justifying blood. As Leviticus 17, 11 tells us, the blood is in the life. But Jesus' blood was also the blood of punishment, the blood of suffering, the blood of death, the blood undergoing judgment in the place of sinners. It's law-satisfying blood. Therefore, it is justifying blood. As Hebrews 9 tells us, Without blood, there is no remission of sins. So, of course, God would direct us back to the blood, which John sees again in Revelation as kind of a hint to us of what we'll be looking at when we see the risen Christ in all of eternity. Uh, there will be some kind of emblems of his suffering. Will it, will it be that his robe is still sprick, uh, sprinkled and, and, and dripping or, or dipped in blood? I don't know. Is it that his wounds will be red for the symbol of blood, his suffering, his death, and his life? I don't know. But we will be singing with the saints of Revelation 5 and other parts of uh, the, the, the book of Revelation. We will be singing about the blood that ransomed us, the blood that saved us, the blood that bought us, the blood that justified us forever and ever and ever. God wants us to think of blood. When you think of justification, don't just think of obedience and death generically, think of blood, the perfect life blood, the suffering poured out death blood is the blood of Jesus and therefore we have justification by his blood, amen. amen. Now all of that however, I know we're half an hour in now, all of that, if you read in the, the grammar, the syntax of verse 9 and 10, that's just a premise since we've been justified by blood, therefore, we now have, therefore there is, it says, verse 9, since, therefore, we have been justified by his blood, now the rest is, is still to come. You think you've just arrived at the, the, how could he be making a better point? If you read Romans 1 and 2 and hear about God's wrath, and the day of wrath to come in the future, and read Romans 3 about the condemnation that comes upon us for every law we knew and didn't obey. Romans 2 about the conscience, which tells us most of God's law, which we should know and should have obeyed. When you get an idea of the furious wrath of God to be poured out then, 
that our sins deserve, the hopeless and helpless condemnation that we sit under, the death that we have to await forever and ever and ever after our physical death, after uh, enmity against God and suffering in this life, when all of that piles up and then after chapter 3 and 4, Paul tells us, no, but there is justification in Christ. He lived the life you couldn't and had to. He died the death you should have but didn't. He has justified you by his blood and you think, that's everything. It couldn't get better. It can't get better. There's nothing left. And Paul says, well, if God can do that, how much more can he move us on to the real blessings? What? I'm, st- I'm still choking on, catching up with, breathless after, after Romans 4. Romans 5 has more? Listen. Since we've been justified by his blood, much more. More? Are you, are you, are you, you, catch, you keeping up with me on this? How dumbfounding that statement is? Much more, not even just a bit more. Much more. I can't fit more in this. So we're going to take a few more hours tonight. <laughs> much more shall we be saved. Be saved. We are saved. We're justified. Much more shall we be saved. That's future. By him. He he can do more from the wrath of God. Wait, hang on. Justification in Christ's death for me means that the wrath of God is fully uh, satisfied. It's, It's done. Well, As far as your personal legal account goes, that's true. But historically, I guess we could say there are like four, maybe five big moments of God's wrath in history. We'll nail them down to to, to a few. You know, there's there's the flood. That's a big one. There's Sodom and Gomorrah. That was a deserved one. There was the captivity and destruction and burning of his own covenant people, Israel, in the Old Testament for their sins. That was pretty intense. Then there's a day of judgment and wrath when God poured out in a way never before seen, uh, dumping down from heaven all of the gory wrath onto Calvary, onto one man, Jesus, who suffered in the place of others. And then the fifth day of judgment and wrath is going to be on Jesus' return when he brings back all of God's angels who like reapers go and collect all of the the human souls from all of the world, place them before the holy judge who God has risen from the dead, Jesus Christ, and everybody will give an account for their sins and pay for their crimes forever in the new hell that he will create, in the new bodies that can never pass away so as to elongate and perpetuate their suffering in hell. That's the last day of judgment. As far as I'm concerned, I should conclude after Romans 3 and 4 and the beginning of 5, God's wrath towards me is done. That doesn't mean historically there's not a day of wrath to come. Here's the worry of Paul, or here's at least the pastoral heart of Paul. You're banking, uh, you're looking at the cross of Jesus and believing for now in a justification. And that's glorious news and maybe continual attendance to church and daily reading the Bible and frequent prayers are able to keep you in a mindset of being, being hopeful, maybe even confident, quietly, humbly confident that you are justified. But the closer the day of wrath comes and the longer you've lived in this flesh, eyes open to your sins, and the more, the, more, the more open and holy God makes your mind, and the more sensitive you get to sin, the day of wrath inches closer, and you may worry. There's still wrath coming, like a huge waterfall at the end of a cave. Have you ever been hiking or, 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 or cave snooping? I don't know what they call it. I've obviously not done it. I pushed some guys in caves and camping trips. I don't think that's the same thing. But hiking and walking and marching through caves and, and, and sometimes there can be a, a large waterfall that looks very severe, a uh, high flow rate. It'll crush you if you walk under it and it's right at the end of the tunnel. And you've been assured by a friend that as long as you're with them, they'll show you the little pathway that goes, you know, diverts, secret, not many people see it. It's a narrow gate and you can bypass the, 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 the torrential downpour of the waterfall. You'll make it. It's okay. We're going. You go, okay, cool. But then you see it. 
and then the closer you get, the more terrifying it seems to be, and you have to bank all the more that there really is an escape from that downpour. And that can be the Christian life if, if Paul doesn't reassure us what he's about to reassure us of in this chapter. That the Christian can look back and be, be, be confident. They're saved. I'm justified. And Jesus is in heaven for me. But, but as the day of wrath grows closer and the more you read the Bible, it turns out even the best of the guys fell. Well, there goes your hope for somebody making it. And, and, and then you look at uh, some of the really bad guys in the Bible remind you a lot of you. And you look back to the wrath. And you read other chapters about God's wrath and his pouring of judgment out on deserving sinners and and the day of wrath as it draws closer. Paul is saying, the day of wrath to come or the wrath of God to come. Here's the news of Christ's justification by blood for you. Since we have been justified by blood, remove any notion that justification is a this lifetime only benefit or that it has an expiry date on it. If you are justified now, freed from God's wrath, under his legal approval and pleasure, you will always, 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 always be under his legal approval and pleasure as a father. So yes, he will pour out his wrath on neighbors, on nations, on family members, maybe, God forbid, but it will happen around you. You'll see it and it will not touch you. As the psalmist says, 10,000 will fall at your side, but the godly will be preserved. The, The justified ones will not taste an ounce, a drop of God's wrath being poured out on judgment day, and this is the promise that we can look to for an assurance of that fact. If we have been justified by blood, or since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. We can add in here, to come. That's the language of chapter 2. The wrath of God is, is the day to come of God's wrath. So if Jesus' blood has justified you now, then you can look to the future certain that you will not pass under any of God's wrath that destroys any notional idea of the doctrine of purgatory, doesn't it? There's no such thing as wrath to come. I'm justified. I don't have to suffer through anything. I am right now justified. I am future tense, saved from the wrath of God. Here's the logical basis of that. And I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter seven. The logical basis the ground of the fact that I'm justified now and I don't have to ask any questions about the future, I'm justified now, so I'm certain I'll be justified in 100 years, should I live so long. I'll be justified in 1,000 years when I'm in heaven then. I'll be justified if I'm alive at the day that Jesus comes back with all his holy angels. I may faint, but I won't be punished. I may get a little bit sunburned in that moment, but I won't be burned. The reason that I can be confident, justified now, saved from any wrath yet to come, is because (laughs) Jesus is still alive. Now, don't hear me say God the Son is still in existence. I mean, obviously, he can't be anything other than that. His life in himself. Now, Jesus, the mediator is still alive as a human mediator in heaven. This is the logical theological basis for future hope in perfect escape from God's wrath and the fact that a few million trillion eons into the future in heaven, God will never say, well, that's about it. I'm getting sick of you. Go home. I've opened the back door. You can go straight to hell now. Um, I'm sick of all of you humans. The reason we know for certain that that's impossible, not just unlikely, oh, God wouldn't do that. No, God can't do that. The reason we know that for certain is because Jesus is in heaven before his Father as the God-man still. That is, if, if Jesus ascended from his disciples and they were all sort of sitting there watching like my boys are when they let go of one of their helium balloons, and he goes up, and he sort of derobes from human nature. 
His body floats off into uh, uh, orbit, and he goes disembodied, dehumanified, back into his glorious, non-spatial, immaterial, uh, divine, purely divine presence, no longer having a human nature uh, added unto himself uh, as the second person of the Trinity. If he did that, our justification would have evaporated in that moment. Because our justification is Jesus Christ. He is our justification. He is our righteousness. He is our redemption. Our righteousness is not, I know I use the analogy, but our righteousness is not actually a, a divinely written long, 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 long list on pieces of paper in heaven. It's not even on papyrus. It's not even carved into stone. It's Jesus himself. He is our righteousness. Do you understand? His righteousness is not just this, this concept that God remembers that life and so he receives it as ours. If Jesus dies, the human soul representing us as perfect in God's presence according to the new covenant dies, our mediator dies, and a non-existent incarnate mediator is as good for us as a dead high priest was to the Jews. There's no one to go in and represent us. Sacrifices can't be made. Or the merit of the sacrifice can't be accepted. Jesus had and still does maintain a human, true human, real body. It's glorified. It's better than the one he had on earth, but it is still truly human. He is still limited in that sense to space. He sits on a throne. His human nature is not omnipresent and everywhere. His divine nature is. Wrap your head around that. But Jesus still has a human nature. And think of the condescension of God. God the Son will always have human affections, emotions, nature, body, soul, mind. Jesus, the God's, God the Son, will always experience covenant love to us and through us, knowing what it is like to be a human, truly being a human, forever. If Jesus lost his incarnate body and nature as he went back up into heaven, that would be the same as the priest making a sacrifice on the altar in the temple, walking out, grabbing a bucket of soapy water and a rag, walking back in and washing all of the blood away. Well, the sacrifice was still made. Yes, but the blood was supposed to stand there as an eternal testament to God. The blood has been sacrificed, forgive the sins they've been atoned for. So Jesus needs to be in heaven forever as a representation of his people. If he loses his humanity, we lose our representation in heaven. And we are back to needing reconciliation and mediation. So since that is the case, the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 25, following this very same logic, look at uh, chapter 7, verse 23. The former priest, that's the priest of the Old Testament, that we've studied a lot through this blood series, the guys who put the blood on the altars of earth, the former priests, well, there were so many of them, right? There was... Hundreds every generation. There was one high priest every generation. Want to take a guess why? Because they kept dying. They were prevented by death from continuing in office. This is a really theological way of saying they're dead. How can they keep doing priestly stuff? They die. They can't make atonement. But, verse 24 says, but he, that's Jesus, but he holds his priesthood permanently. Because he continues forever. He has argued earlier in Hebrews chapter 2 that he can only be a priest because he has the incarnate flesh and blood. So he's not just saying that he's now alive from the dead, he exists in heaven in the spiritual realm. Our God-man, human mediator, is in heaven with flesh and blood, and in that sense, lives forever, continues forever. Therefore, consequently, verse 25 says, he's able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him because he always lives to make intercession for them. So that just as the old priest, though they died, but in a limited sense, they would make the sacrifice, then pray to God, forgive the people, receive the sacrifice, be merciful according to your promises. So also Jesus made the sacrifice on earth, resurrected into a body, went into the perfect holy place before God, and now dwells there forever to make intercession for you and I, praying for us and always showing the emblems of his dying love in blood through scars to his father to be accepted in your place. 
He is our justification. His blood is our justification and his blood is in heaven for us. Here's the logic that Paul makes back in Romans 5 verse 10. Go there. Romans 5 verse 10 as we come to a close. This is the much more. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For, let, let, let him argue it for a moment. So, you know, every Christian who sometimes feels, I know I'm saved, but will I stay saved? I know I'm justified, but am I certain that God won't pour wrath upon me after sinning and making so many stupid folly and foolish mistakes in this life? Will he, your post justification, will he never pay, make me pay for any of them? The language of Paul is, God forbid. That's not blasphemy. Is it? No, no, God literally forbids you from thinking that way. You're not allowed to. If you're justified, how much more will he save you from wrath to come? Stop it. <laughs> he forbids you from asking that question. Logically, it doesn't work. Now, now, there's a difference between saying that and saying, I know, I believe, I'm saved from the wrath to come. Oh, I wish my feelings would catch up with that. I'm so worried, I'm so fearful, but you can condemn, you can speak to, preach to, and rebuke your feelings and say, how much more? God forbid me ask that question and call into question his justice. I'm justified, I will forever be justified unless Jesus falls out of heaven under the condemnation of his father or loses his human nature. I am justified and saved from wrath. For, here's the logic. It's an argument from lesser to greater, and it feels blasphemous to call the cross of Jesus lesser. But it's the argument from the lesser to the greater. Or in another sense, from the greater to the lesser. I'll show you what I mean. Paul says, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, right? if the cross accomplished what we've said the cross accomplished, much more, now that we are reconciled, Shall we be saved by his, allow me to insert this word, by his continuing forever life? If the death of Jesus saved us while we were enemies, how much more will the continual heavenly reign of Jesus alive help us if we're not even enemies anymore? The argument is this. You were enemies of God, yet he loved you. How much more must his love be bound to you who are his friends? You were criminals, criminals before, yet he sent his son for you. How much more must he give up for you now that you are reconciled to him? I mean, if he'll do that for his enemy, what would he do for his children? If he kills his son for the people that hate him, what will he do for those who love him with love incorruptible? If he does all of that and kills his son on the cross for the sons of the devil, what would he do for the sons of God? If you were condemned by his law, yet he gave your sin to Jesus to be paid for, how much more would he seek to bless you now that you're in a status of justification and no one needs to die for him to bless you? You were an eon away and could not be saved without the butchering of his son. Yet he gave his son for you in death. How much more will he do to keep you now that you cost him nothing and you are already his precious possession? When I was sinking down beneath God's righteous frown, Christ laid aside his crown for my soul. If he did that while I was under God's frown, what would he do for me now that I am under God's righteous smile? That is to say, in the language of Romans 5, if Jesus was able to just, if God's love was so marvelous and wondrous that Jesus could justify me before God while a filthy sinner, how much more can he do for my case now that I am a justified saint? The logic is tight and pure. I am forbidden from thinking that there is any such thing as falling away from salvation or losing my justification. There's no chance that he will let my sin or your sin or your failings 
Keep you from glory. He will save you from the wrath to come. That day will not be bitter for you or one of fear and judgment, but one of glorious salvation and joy. If Jesus could do that while we were lost, imagine what God will do for, now imagine, falls short. I can't. I'm still wrapping my head around the lesser thing, apparently, dying for enemies on the cross. I, I can't imagine what love looks like within his household already. But here is at least one thing that Paul requires us by divine command for us to conclude. How much more? Uh, how much more joy, as verse 11 says? How much more am I, what am I supposed to conclude? What is the effect of Jesus' life in heaven for me? His death accomplished enemy to son. Now that I'm a son, I'm to imagine this infinite eternal round of blessings. Do you know at least one other thing that we can talk about tonight that the justifying blood of Jesus does for you and accomplishes for you? It removes any logical ground of Christian uncertainty of salvation. Paul has written this to not just prove the gospel, but add to that knowledge internalized, subjective, logical, received, reasonable assurance, an infallible assurance. God doesn't just want to get you to heaven. He wants you to know now beyond all certainty, know more than you know anything, that you are saved, and if saved, by the cross, then saved from the wrath to come. And if blessed by Jesus' death, I can't even begin to list what's going to happen. I mean, I couldn't list all the sins that I'm saved from. I don't know what language to utilize to express how speechless I am about the benefits that must now come now that I'm in God's household under his smile and the law is for me. We can't put it into words, but we can glory in it. So if you're not a Christian, if you haven't trusted Jesus, you're under condemnation. You're the weak, ungodly, sinner, criminal. You're lost, and Jesus delights to find the lost. Jesus delights to justify the ungodly by giving you his life, by counting you in his death, and presenting you perfect to his Father, who receives you under his law, and then makes you a son that he blesses, a child that he blesses, a friend that he blesses in ways we literally cannot conceive of. So I'm glad that God has given us eternity to express and experience a few percentage fractions of all of God's glory. Believe in Jesus today and be saved. That is God's good news for you. And if you are saved now, then God forbid any fear for the future. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the good news that you have not just spoken to us, not just alerted us of, but that you have accomplished in real time and space history, in and through the flesh and blood mediator Messiah, your own eternal divine son, who became Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the prophet and the priest and the king, the sacrifice, the lamb, the high priest, everything, so that by his blood we could be justified. We thank you that your loving kindness appeared in history and brought salvation for all kinds of people. We thank you that in your grace, you decided to love wondrously the lost, the ungodly, the weak, the sinful, the evil, the unrighteous. We thank you that you condescended so far, that you incarnated so low, that you suffered so grievously, Lord Jesus, that you gave your son to be killed, Father God, Holy Spirit, that you now open up and bequeath to us so many glorious, infinite, incomprehensible benefits that come to us through Jesus' blood. We thank you, Lord God. We ask that you lead us into a high praise, a high glory, a high standard of living and holiness because of the certainty, the certainty that we have that we are saved from all of your wrath. I pray that you save people tonight who have up until now not been converted and not been saved and not known the joy of awaiting glory to come. Please give that to them tonight, Lord God. We pray all of these things in the wonderful name of our Savior. And every person said...